Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Serving the Underserved, a conversation with Common Spirit Health about equity in healthcare. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Morgan and I will be moderating today's webinar. So before we begin, I'm gonna walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We will begin today's webinar with the presentation and panel, and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box that you see on your screen. Today's session is also being recorded and will be available after the event. So you can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access that recording. And if at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, just try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We're here to help. I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined today as we discuss the very important topic of health equity, including the systems and processes that are needed to address longstanding health disparities, you know, gaps that were greatly exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're joined by Dr. Alicia Cole of Common Spirit Health, a nonprofit health system that operates more than 130 hospitals across 21 states. Dr. Cole joined Common Spirit in 2020 serving as the system's first Vice President of Population Health Innovation and Policy. Dr. Cole leads Common Spirit Population Health Initiatives focused on vulnerable populations, health equity, and clinical care transformation through innovation with a focus on value. We're also joined by Royal Tothill, who is the co-founder and general manager of Docent Health at Get Well Network. Royal is responsible for the continued growth and financial performance of Docent Health as a business unit within Get Well Network. With more than 15 years of experience in healthcare innovation and business strategy, he brings a wealth of knowledge to bear on consumer engagement, product development, and population health. We're here today to discuss Common Spirit and Get Well Network's shared goal of improving access to care and ensuring health equity across all patient populations and how digital technology can help achieve that goal. So as we dive into our discussion, um, Dr. Cole, I'd love to direct this first question to you. I know you joined Common Spirit a little over a year ago. So can you talk about a bit about how Common Spirit came to be and how your focus on caring for the whole patient with compassion and human kindness has been so critical this year? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome and thank you for the opportunity uh, to present to all of you today. Um, as mentioned, uh, Common Spirit Health is um, an extremely large integrated uh, care delivery system. Uh, it is the strategic combination between Dignity Health and Catholic Health Initiatives. Uh, and that combination occurred in uh, 2019. Um, and so part of the reason that the two organizations joined uh, was because of this commitment to uh, serving the vulnerable and really being advocates for social justice and just the thought of what the two organizations combined could do to move those conversations forward. Uh, and so with that, uh, that did um, you know, put us as one of the largest nonprofit healthcare systems in the country. Uh, we are the largest Medicaid provider um, in the country. And as mentioned, we have over, really over a thousand care sites because we have ambulatory, we have hospitals, we have home health, we have uh, nursing homes. Um, so really over a thousand care sites across almost half the country, so 21 states. And quite frankly, that is one of the reasons that I, I joined Common Spirit was because embedded in the mission, embedded in the vision, embedded in our, all of our values um, is this um, principle of taking care of those who are less fortunate. Um, and again, really advocating to, to move the conversation of good health forward. Um, and we recognize that you know, what actually impacts health, as you see here on the scene, uh, on the screen, um, 
the, the biggest drivers of our health outcomes are not what happens necessarily in the clinical care setting. Um, and so how do we look at that 80%, uh, you know, the social determinants of health, the things that are happening in our communities where we, you know, live, work, play, and worship, um, and how as a large integrated healthcare system, we can be more thoughtful and intentional about how we um, help people uh, with those social determinants of health. So. It has been an amazing journey so far. Uh, yes, it has only been a little bit over a year, but I'm really, truly honored and excited to be a part of such an amazing organization. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole, for talking about that first year and giving us an overview of um, just the importance of social determinants of health um, and your job in the system as well. Royal, so Docent Health, I know, is now part of Get Well Network and Common Spirit you know, both of those companies have been partners since 2016. So can you talk about how Docent Health Solutions deliver on the promise of improving health, especially for the most vulnerable? Yeah, thank you, Morgan. Um, uh, pleasure to be here. And it's been, uh, as you mentioned, a number of years now that we've been a partner uh, with First Dignity and now Common Spirit. And it's been a real honor to work with them and commit to the mission of serving vulnerable populations. Um, uh, and I think the key part for us of, of doing that is, and one, it's just important to all people, that we lower the barriers to engagement um, and, and that we also are starting from a position of trust and empathy. And obviously that's incredibly important for vulnerable populations as well. Um, and so a couple of things that we do to even set the platform to be able to be effective in, in delivering on that mission is one, from a technology perspective, engaging broadly. Uh, we use SMS communications to lower the barriers to engaging with patients. So it's the most widely utilized channel for communications. 96% um, of the population have access to SMS. And so we've invested a lot in being able to communicate broadly and that's been extremely important for vulnerable populations. Uh, um, but then also we need to ensure that we are delivering empathy and that we are starting with a place of trust, um, particularly where there are communities that have systemic barriers or there's historical mistrust. Um, and so the most effective way that we've found to do that is really engage closely at the community level. Uh, and so in addition to having a technology platform that helps us scale across communities, we augment the technology with community-based navigators that are hired from the communities we serve to make sure that they are reflecting of the communities and the cultures um, and engaging in those communities to build that trust and build empathy so we can start the program. So I think those are the two I think, most critical components to getting started for us. Uh, and then from there, we can guide patients through um, and navigate them through complex health system and community resources. And so we're preparing them, we're educating them, we're screening for things like social determinants of health and referring to services. We're screening for mental health and referring to services that are either part of the larger health system uh, or are available in their communities. So um, that's really the foundation in which we start sort of for all people, but it becomes extremely important uh, as we talk about vulnerable populations. Yeah, absolutely, Royal. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about that empathy component. Um, Dr. Cole, you know, when you refer to an empathetic approach to care, how exactly does that apply to addressing the needs of underserved populations and improving health equity? And how does your partnership with Get Well Network bring you closer to that goal? No, thank you. So I'm a family medicine physician. Uh, that's, that's my background. That's my specialty. Um, I specifically chose family medicine because I wanted to take care of families in the larger uh, community. Um, and I felt called to uh, serve the underserved. And so uh, my clinical experience has been based in rural uh, Southeast uh, part of our country, as well as urban um, centers. Um, but um, I have always served uh, you know, what may be considered underserved or, or vulnerable. And, you know, myself coming from uh, a similar background, um, you know, was even more of a reason that I wanted to make sure that I was serving 
people in communities who look like me or maybe had experienced some of the same things that I experienced um, growing up. And so I think when you start to think about that place of um, empathy and how do we extend that, um, that's critically important. And even now, you know, I'm so excited that there's so much emphasis and conversation around health disparities and around social determinants of health, um, but also recognizing that, you know, social determinants of health is, is actually someone's lived experience. So we may put categories on it. We may say, oh, they are food insecure, they are ha they're housing insecure. Um, but at the end of the day, that is their lived experience. Those are the th things that they are, you know, focusing on and dealing with on a day to day basis. And, you know, we have to be really thoughtful about how we even have those um, conversations. So, you know, one of the things that we loved about uh, Docent and, and part of the reason that we uh, went with their platform was, as Royal mentioned, um, having the SMS or the text messaging capability. Uh, we know that digital um, access and digital literacy is um, is often an issue, especially in specific populations where maybe English as a second language or our seniors. Um, and so uh, we wanted to make sure that if we're bringing a technology with a focus on vulnerable, we bring a technology that they can actually use, right? Uh, and so, you know, that was one of the key things that was important to us and what drew us to Docent um, and get well. I would say the other thing also is having those conversations up front with your partners, you know, and your business partners and your vendors, um, whoever that may be. If this is a part of our organization, health equity is core to our mission and our vision and our values, then making sure that you're introducing that conversation into your vendor partners or your business partners very early on to see if there's alignment. Um, and, you know, thankfully with those and get well, there was immediate uh, alignment. These are things that they have been working on um, for years as well. And so, you know, by recognizing that, how do you then start to intentionally build solutions that have health equity at the center versus it being the, the afterthought, right? And, and I think that's kind of what we saw with COVID. Although, you know, if you ask those of us who have been focused on equity and population health and health disparities, you know, we could have very clearly told you early on who was going to be dis proportionately affected by COVID. Uh, there wasn't anything new in the patterns that we saw with COVID that we don't see with maternity outcomes or diabetes or heart disease. Um, and so I think you have to really start as you're innovating to have equity at the core, as you know, at the center, um, or at least one of the, the values so that you're not creating something that unintentionally brings, you know, introduces bias or, or you know, other things that drive disparity. And so if you do that from the beginning, uh, it, it makes it a, a much easier conversation. So that's one of the things that we did. You know, we wanted to make sure that um, we looked at the engagement. So if you look at patient navigation research, um, a lot of which is based on the uh, oncology and the oncology specialty and in-person navigation services. Um, but if you look at what is out there, what you find is that um, certain populations, especially communities of color, don't engage in those services as high as other um, populations. And so that was one of the things we wanted to make sure early on that we were evaluating, you know, especially with this being a digital, uh, uh, you know, platform, we wanted to make sure that that engagement was similar. And so what we saw and continue to see is that we have just as high of engagement um, with our Black and African American uh, birthing people as we do across the board. So 66%. Um, and we actually have higher engagement rates in our Hispanic um, population, 72%. And I think that goes back to uh, also what Royal said about making sure that we had this kind of in-person community support. And so the commitment that Docent made to hire people from the communities that they're serving was really critical to us. Um, and so, for example, um, 
in California, we have a population that speaks Mixteco, uh, which is, is, is a little different than uh, Spanish. And so, you know, Royal and his team made a commitment to hire someone, hire a docent um, who spoke mix, Mixteco and came from that community. So, you know, I think those little nuanced uh, intentional actions um, actually has helped uh, really eliminate, if you will, the disparity of engagement um, for this program. Thank you so much, Dr. Cole. So many excellent examples there. And we'd love to even dive into this conversation further about the practical applications for some of how these solutions can be used to address the SDOH um, issues and gaps in care. So, Royal, anything to add on to what Dr. Cole has just talked about? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I, I think the focus on equity, um, and I love how you said that, Dr. Cole, of starting with equity um, and having that being sort of the democratizing principle that you build your engagement off of, as opposed to something that you try to tack on at the end is so important. Um, and to, to your point earlier, starting with partners that have that same philosophy is really critical. And um, I know Get Well Network, this has been an important part of their mission and values for the past 20 years. It's been a central part of the philosophy of Docent. Um, and starting with that notion of how do we deliver personalized care for all, um, and really an emphasis on all, what does that mean if we are going to truly democratize these types of services across the communities we serve? and make sure that nobody's falling through the cracks. Um, it forces you to think about it in, in a different way, and it forces you to think about what is the technology enablement that I need to be able to do this at scale? Um, because we know these models of navigation work. We've typically only ever deployed them in the costliest communities or in the, mo in the like, VIP communities. But if we can leverage the power of digital and technology innovation to scale these and then be really thoughtful about how do we engage at a community level? You can see equality impacts impacted across the board. And so some of the stats that are here, I think are uh, we're really proud of and just being able to engage with particular communities and whether that's agrarian workers uh, and large immigrant populations uh, in California or it's native communities and indigenous communities or it's inner city communities, we are actively ensuring that these programs are starting with a point of equity. Um, and, and you've got to tailor that to the geographies and the social constructs of the different communities you're serving. Absolutely. I mean, navigating the healthcare journey can certainly be a daunting challenge, um, regardless of a pandemic that's going on. Um, so Royal, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how digital technology can help patients navigate the system and connect with these appropriate resources um, that can meet their specific needs. Yeah, so th there's really two, I think, sides of the coin that are important. One is using technology to be able to engage broadly uh, and have an established trusted channel of communication so that we can connect longitudinally with patients, community members, members, depending on the model. Um, and then the other side is we have to understand what are the available resources and information and services that are in as part of the health system uh, and also around them in the community. And so the technology platform that we've built enables us to connect with patients over time, um, build a 360 degree profile of who those individuals are screen for social determinants of health up front, screen for mental health needs, screen for personal preferences, understand where they live in their geographies and if they're at higher risk from a social determinants perspective, um, and then be able to take that information and the attributes at an individual level and map that up to the right information at the right time or the right resource or the right digital application or the right clinical service um, or the right community service and so that's really the two sides of the technology that enable us to do this at scale, is connecting upstream, connecting longitudinally, using that information to get a better holistic understanding of who the individual is, um, and then mapping that to and making connections to the resources. And that could be to a downstream pediatrician, that could be to uh, my chart or your portal, that could be to a food service or a housing service or a 
doula program, depending on what the needs are of an individual. Um, and so that's really the two sides that we've been working on from a technology perspective to make sure that we are increasing health literacy, that we're increasing self-advocacy, that we're connecting to the right resources at the right time that we know are designed to help deliver better health outcomes. Excellent. Thank you so much for diving into that. It's really helpful um, insights, Royal. And I know, Dr. Cole, we've already talked in this conversation, just the, the immense importance that social determinants of health, um, the non-clinical factors that affect a person's health have on their outcomes. And you've already given some really good examples about how you're using technology um, to sift through those, but we'd love to hear some more about that, just specifically linking that technology to addressing social determinants of health in your patient communities. Yeah, so, you know, I think there's a lot of different um, opportunities to use data um, and especially data that we're now collecting around social determinants of health. So, of course, most immediately, how can you use that data to take better care of of my patient, right? I mean, that's as a, as a physician, that's, that's the first thing that, you know, comes to mind. And so, you know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand, you mentioned just the, the difficulties of navigating the healthcare system. Um, and I would say, even if you're connected in the healthcare system, um, you know, I think about my mother's journey in um, her diagnosis of breast cancer. And, you know, I was right there. I kind of served as her pseudo navigator. Um, and I was very aware and knew all of the people and knew the system and and it was still challenging, right, <laughs> to, to help my mom navigate through some of the needs that she she had. And so recognizing that it is a, a very difficult um, system to navigate through, even if you're resourced, um, but if you're not resourced, you know, just how amplified that, that challenge is. So um, really always continuously thinking through how do we use innovation and technology to make that care delivery system more accessible, um, easier to navigate, um, and recognizing that we need help <laughs> in doing that. So uh, it may not be just the health system, you know, ourselves completely figuring out what to do and how to address social determinants of health. However, uh, there are things that uh, we do have an opportunity to do, um, especially as large integrated healthcare systems or large hospitals, where sometimes or often uh, we tend to be anchors in the communities that we're serving. And so, one of the things that we've really been looking at as we have implemented screening across our system in different markets in different ways. Um, so, in some ways, that has been leveraging a platform like Docent uh, and other markets that's having community health workers embedded in primary care offices um, and other markets that's screening that's happening by our uh, discharge navigators at time of discharge from the hospital. So, you know, using a lot of different ways to, to gather the data, but then using that data to actually help us drive other business decisions. Um, and so when you look at things like your community benefit or your community health, you know, how do you use the information that you're getting to say, well, wait a minute, a lot of our patients are screening positive for food insecurity. Um, okay, so what are the needs? And are, clearly there are needs in our community. How, are, how can we as a hospital, as a large healthcare system, think differently about maybe our community partners, or our community benefit? Are we investing in community organizations that are addressing food insecurity? Are we investing in organizations that are addressing housing? And so, you know, our community health department at Common Spirit has done an amazing job of really starting to take this information and use it to drive some of these you know, community benefit and business um, decisions. So I think that's um, another key uh, element of gathering this data and why it's important to get the data. Of course, it's to take better care of the patient in front of us always. Um, but at the same time, as you start to see patterns and themes, how can that actually change your business decision? How does it affect your growth strategy, right? So one of the things that sometimes you can see is, wait, there's a huge need for pediatric 
uh, in this market or for more, you know, imp- you know, improved access to primary care. So, you know, does that change what how we're thinking about growing uh, as an organization? So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to use the data that, you know, you're you're collecting around social determinants of health um, to not only take good you know, good care of patients, but to also take better care of the community at large. I knew Dr. Cole was going to go to data. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, important. It's, a, it's such an important part, I think, of the of the partnership in general that, that we have, and, and obviously across the board for other programs that they're working on. Um, but it's been a really big focus for us as well. And to, the, to, to Dr. Cole's point about the, the macro insights that you can get in terms of understanding resources and needs in the community and using that to optimize the network that you're building. Um, but even on a granular level, um, like we've been making sure that we are collecting race and ethnicity data. Uh, and what we found is that's not always available in the EMR as much as you would think it is. Um, and it's not always consistent with what the patient would report as their race or ethnicity. And so as we started to dig in the data, we found some of those disparities of wow, patient reported data is often different than what the provider reported data is around race and ethnicity. And that can really impact how we engage those communities, engage that individual, connect them to resources, communicate with them. And so collecting the data both at a macro level and at a very individual level is such an important part of being able to to deliver these programs effectively. And I would just piggyback on that and, and Royal knows. And those of you who do know me know I am a data nerd <laughs> um, behind the scenes. But um, I think the other really critical aspect of that that Royal mentioned was the patient reported. Um, and, and so how do you make sure you're including patients um, in communities, um, especially if you're if you're bringing solutions that you want to have intentional focus on certain underserved or vulnerable populations, how do you make sure you're including them in the process? Um, and so that's one of the things, you know, again, I often hear that from my patients um, is that, oh, you know, he, you know, here you guys go again, bringing some sort of solution and you didn't even ask us if that's what we wanted or needed. Um, and so I think that's been one of the things we've really been thoughtful about. Um, and again, Docent has been a, a great partner to us in getting that feedback um, from patients <laughs> real time um, so that we can use that feedback to continue to improve the, the solution. You know, it's hard to argue against a plan to improve health equity, right? Um, But to those organizations out there who are trying to decide how to do this for themselves, can you share a little bit, Dr. Cole, how how do you get buy-in for such an initiative? And alternatively, what is the cost of not addressing health equities and gaps in care? You know, is, is it more than just a moral imperative at this point? And how do you get started operationally? Yeah, that that's a great question. And again, I, I have to say that um, I'm pretty lucky, and, and and I think Royal would say this too uh, about his organization. You know, f- fortunately, I'm a part of uh, an organization with an amazing senior leader, Lloyd Dean, as our CEO, uh, an amazing board. Um, that and again, this this is a part of who we are and what we do. Um, and and same, I would say with Royal and Michael O'Neill and the work that they're doing at at Get Well Network. So, you know, I have to say that senior leadership, engagement, buy-in, understanding um, that is inclusive of, you know, the executive team as well as the board um, is critically important. And I think, I don't think if you went to those individuals and said, do you care about, you know, people having great health, that they're going to say no, right? (laughs) But I do think that there's still an opportunity for us to educate um, those individuals, those leaders, those boards about um, why this work is extremely important. And so, you know, to your point about is there a moral imperative? Well, you know, 
I will say, and probably part of, of this is because I feel so passionate about it because I'm a mom. Um, I have two boys. Um, I had a, a traumatic first uh, birth experience. Um, and, you know, when people think about the, the disparities that exist in maternity care in this country, uh, they often think about disparities from the standpoint of, for example, as a, as a well-educated African-American woman, I still have a four times higher likelihood of having some sort of complication during childbirth. What we don't tend to think about, though, is if you look at the developing countries in the world, um, as in the United States, we still rank middle of the list as it relates to maternity outcomes in general. So that means white women here still have a higher chance of complications um, in birth and childbirth than women in Sweden, for example. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we have to really think about the larger impact of what, uh, you know, what disparities exist. Um, and so, you know, from the, the moral standpoint, um, yes, I mean, every person who has a baby in this country should be able to experience a great outcome. Um, and so as much as possible, and we should be working towards that every day. However, there is also a financial imperative. And, and I think that's the thing that, um, especially as healthcare leaders, um, we have to really start thinking about. Uh, you know, if you look at a couple of different studies um, around the costs of what disparities have caught, you know, cost this country, you know, we're looking in the billions and some, in, in some estimates, trillions of dollars. And that's just based off of people experiencing different levels of care or a variation of care delivery based on how they look or how much money they have or if they have insurance or not. Um, so it's extremely costly, you know, and, and I think we're up to 18% of the GDP right now. And, and, and that's just anticipated to grow exponentially over the next 10 or 15 years. So it's not financially sustainable for us to continue to deliver care the way that we are right now which is in a, still a very volume-based fee-for-service model. Now, we're transitioning, though, right? We're moving into to more value-based care. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I, I, I have a wonderful opportunity to teach medical students and residents often, and, you know, one of my, like, little quirks, all attendings have them, is um, noncompliance. I, I don't believe in patients being non-compliant. So all of my students and residents know not to use that term with me. I think people have barriers to achieving their best health, um, but I don't believe that they are non-compliant. And as you move into more value-based care, you kind of have to get rid of that term anyway. Because right now in the vol volume-based model, right, I get paid, my system gets paid based on the number of people I see every day or the number of procedures I may perform, you know, as a, as a family medicine doctor. Um, in a value-based system, I get paid on how well my patients are doing, right? So how, if my patient has diabetes, um, how well controlled is their sugar? Well, that, that changes things. Like I can't just say the patient's non-compliant now. Now I have to go, okay, why is their hemoglobin A1C greater than eight? Um, you know, what are their barriers to, is it they can't afford their medication? Is their medication causing side effects? Do they not have access to healthy foods? Are they not able to exercise? You know, you have to really start to dive deeper um, and, and get to know the patient and get to know the community that they're coming from because maybe they don't have a grocery store in their community. You know, we have a lot of food deserts in this country. Um, so, there's now this financial imperative for us to really think about, especially as we move into more value-based care. Yeah, just to, to tap onto that, Dr. Goh, I, I completely agree. I think what the pandemic has also done from a macro perspective uh, is show health executives, healthcare executives, how or fragile the business model is. And so we've been in this 
area of kind of a foot in two canoes, fee for service, value based care, and some have been moving faster than others. I, I think what the last year and a half has shown is that um, leaders are looking to try to figure out how do they diversify their business models, and so they aren't so exposed to some of the the, the cost. Uh, of care that we've seen over the last year and a half. And so there is um, increasingly a, a pretty accelerated shift into value-based care. Even on the fee-for-service side, and as we're making that transition for organizations like Common Spirit that have a pretty significant Medicaid population, you're only getting paid cents on the dollar for delivering that care. So it's really important just from a financial perspective that we're managing and engaging those communities and Medicaid specifically uh, to ensure that we are helping to reduce length of stay, reducing um, readmission rates. Um, and obviously we have a, a pretty sizable program in maternal child health with Common Spirit. If you can reduce NICU utilization and NICU length of stay for Medicaid babies, there's really significant cost savings in that for the health system. And so I think one of the opportunities that we've had over the last few years uh, in the partnership is helping to drive down the costs associated with delivering care to vulnerable populations and the Medicaid population. But it also then sets you up to be able to take on risk and move to value more effectively. And so as we shift into value-based care, health equities becomes even more important and thinking about social determinants of health and whole person health and wellness, as, as Dr. Cole was describing, is really critical. And so now we have a mechanism to engage a person more holistically, longitudinally, understand who they are, navigate them to the right resources at the right time. And that's a totally different business proposition uh, and value driver for a health system. And so there's there's financial benefits and value on, on either side of those, depending on where a particular health system is in that journey. Such great points from both of you. Thank you so much for connecting those dots between the moral imperatives and the financial aspect of this conversation as well. Um, before we get into the Q&A portion, I, I have one final question for you both, and it's really forward looking. We'd love to hear about what's next for Common Spirit and its partnership with Get Well Network's Docent Health. Um, so to each of you, what's next? What do you you know, anticipate um, and how can you build and want to expand on what you have both already done? Uh, maybe, Rora, let's start with you and then um, Dr. Cole, you can go next. Yeah, happy to. Um, one of the things that we're, we're really proud of uh, on the Get Well Network side uh, is a program that we're, we're launching right now um, to support vaccines. And so we have a partnership with Common Spirit um, and Deloitte um, to help address vaccine deserts. Um, and so leveraging the same community-based tech-enabled navigator model to engage really vulnerable communities um, where vaccine hesitation and vaccine access um, is a real problem. And so we're starting in a couple of communities, um, Central Valley, California, so high immigrant population, agrarian field workers, um, and leveraging the same model to help address uh, vaccine hesitancy and, and some of the systemic barriers to engaging those communities and, and bringing them into uh, the healthcare system. And then another uh, community uh, is Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, and so very different social dynamics, very different communities, a same model. Uh, and I think that's um, one, obviously extremely timely with the Delta variant coming up um, and really wreaking havoc on a lot of the provider systems. Um, but it's also, I think, really encouraging as, as we talk about the potential to take this into a broader ambulatory environment. Um, and I know, I, I think uh, Dr. Cole and I would both communicate that we're excited about the potential for, for value-based care. And as you look at the same sort of constructs and what they could mean as you move into value-based care and you, and you take on more risk in communities. Yes, thank you, Royal. Um, really excited about the, the work with, uh, with uh, Deloitte uh, in Get Well around COVID vaccine is just so critically important um, right now. And uh, unfortunately, we still have work to do uh, in, in that space. So, um, so thank you, Royal, for mentioning that. I think the other thing that we have seen is, you know, really how do you, once you have piloted or kind of did your proof of concept uh, with the technology, you know, how do you kind of continue to innovate and evolve to um, to leverage that technology in other areas and other care solutions? So we are actually looking to launch 
a, a, a similar uh, navigation program with our orthopedic um, journeys uh, starting actually in the upcoming year. Uh, in our pilot, again, some of the the work that we or the results that we saw were uh, statistically significant reductions in length of stay um, for uh, patients who were coming in for elective hips and knees, um, and uh, you know, so we're we're looking at um, adding other um, measures to that. So looking at readmissions, of course, continuing to look at social determinants of health, um, and and thinking through again, um, what are some of these other areas that we can potentially use a navigation, a virtual kind of navigation um, platform. So really excited to uh, continue this work. Uh, I think, you know. The other thing I would just highlight is, again, recognizing that we can't do this work ourselves um, and that it's okay to lean on other partners um, who are just as committed and passionate about reducing inequity and improving the health of, of every community. I think one of the, so the other areas that um, we're really excited about on the, on the Dose and Get Well Network side as well, and and conversations with Common Spirit, but other partners is the technology platform that we built to help tech enable some of the, the virtual community-based navigators um, is now starting to be used by our health system partners as well. And so there's a whole sort of army of um, care professionals whose job to be done isn't facilitated by the EMR effectively. And it's not really designed to meet their day-to-day -day work. Um, and so, the opportunity to leverage the technology that we have uh, and helping to support community care, uh, community health workers, care navigators, care managers, social workers. I think there's a ton of potential as we continue to look down that path and how do we tech enable and scale and give more outreach, more um, of a granular ability to connect uh, and, and engage with empathy and guide patients to the right services at the right time. And so I think that's another really big area of opportunity that we're, we're continuing to look into as well. Some really exciting work for both of you and really impactful stuff going on here. So thank you both for giving us an insight, a preview into it. Um, we're going to jump over to our Q&A portion of the conversation today. And we have Time for a couple questions from the audience. So if you haven't already, type them those questions into the Q&A chat box on your webinar council, and we'll try to get through as many as we can today. So well, this first question that has come in is for you. And an audience member is wondering, what sort of analytics and reporting is Docent Health able to provide its users? Yeah, great question. Well. Um... Dr. Cole is certainly pushing us on data and analytics every day. It's been, uh, you know, it's been a great part of our partnership, but I think a shared philosophy to data tells a story and using data to inform how do you continue to optimize and improve, not just what you're doing, but at a macro level, what are the insights that we can bring to our partners? So we use data and reporting in probably three main categories. One is operationally, how do we understand what's happening in the programs, how do we continue to refine and improve them? The second reporting category uh, that we have is what's the value that it's creating for our partners? And so we typically align very early in conversations before we get started on what does success look like um, as a vendor, as a partner? Um, what, what does it need to look like at the end of the contract period to ensure that there's never any question of whether or not we're gonna renew? Um, and so we set that up up front. We have reporting dashboards to help them track on a real-time basis what the value that's being derived from the programs is. Uh, and I think that's a really important um, uh, transparency tool between the partnerships to make sure that we're continuing to improve. Uh, and then the third, uh, which we talked a little bit about and is really exciting as we think about what are the insights that you can derive from all of these engagements. And as we collect data from the EMR, as we pull in data from digital programs, as we pull in third-party data, um, as we collect a lot of unique data from the engagements of patients, either their behavioral data, how they interact with us, or self-reported data, um, there's a tremendous amount of insights. And so we're cross-walking that with third-party data like social deprivation indices, so we can see what are our engagement rates in very specific communities locally, um, and using that to help drive some of the mission oriented goals around health equity and inclusion and vulnerable populations. So 
um, tremendous amount of opportunity in data, and it's been a, an area that we've we've been investing in, but still, I think a lot more opportunity in terms of the insights that we can derive as we continue to expand. Absolutely. And I would Thank just you, um, quickly oh, add me. to that, <laughs> Morgan, is just also <laughs> around the clinical outcomes data. Um, so that was one of the other things that we really made sure we wanted to um, build in. Um, and so we're looking at health outcomes data like preterm birth rates, low birth rate, uh, breastfeeding initiation, C-section rates, um, as well as uh, utilization outcomes. So looking at um, length of stay, looking at readmissions, um, looking at uh, our goal is to hopefully start to look at unnecessary um, ED utilization in, in the future. Um, so, um, so really making sure that there's the health outcomes and uh, utilization um, outcomes that's tied to the analytics as well. Wonderful. And this next question is really a follow up to that. Dr. Cole, you listed a lot of great data that you get from Docent Health. And, you know, are there any of these categories that you're finding particularly valuable? And can you share any ways that you might be leveraging the learnings from those data points that you talked about? Yes, yeah, so I'll actually bring up uh, something that Royal mentioned uh, earlier in, in this conversation was around uh, we wanted to make sure that the patient um, was reporting their race and ethnicity. Um, and so that's already being pulled over from our ADT feeds that Docent receives. Um, but uh, we also knew that there were certain areas that had a certain markets that had an opportunity to improve capture rate for race, ethnicity, uh, language, uh, data. And so being able to really start to see, we, we also recognize that the, um, the standards around how that information was being collected in our system was also variable. Um, and so being able to then see that, well, wait, there's about a 13 to 15 percent uh, variance in race and ethnicity data that is being pulled over and what the patient is reporting um, really allowed us to move forward with um, a very strong um, recommendation that we um, standardize the collection of race, ethnicity, and language data across our entire organization, uh, standardize the mapping of that data, and, and actually do training uh, and, so, and, and education to our support staff, our registration staff, our nursing staff, whoever that may be, who's collecting that information on on why it's important to maybe just not make a visual, <laughs> right? And um, I think that happens more than people really like to recognize, right? And, and, and again, I'll use myself as an example. Uh, previously in the, in the health systems that I worked at prior to uh, Common Spirit Health, um, my whole family was taken care of by that health system. And I noticed one day when I took, I have two boys, I took them in for their well child check. Um, I had one son that was listed as African-American and one son that was listed as Caucasian. Um, and no one had ever asked me um, what, you know, what we identified as, what my children identified as. So I made a joke about it at the, at the registration desk. And I said, you know, it was probably based on how I had my hair. I used to change my hair a lot. And maybe if I had a tan the day that you marked my one child, you know, Caucasian. <laughs> um, but that actually, I use that, um, that health system to take that forward there and say, hey guys, you know, I think we really need to look at how are we training our staff on how to input this data and, you know, best practice is for a patient, for an individual to self-report that. So really excited that for us at Common Spirit, uh, that is uh, one of our health equity board metrics. Um, it is a board metric. And so I think going back to how do you start to get that buy-in, um, you have to you have to make it as important as growth metrics, as um, you know, health outcome quality metrics. Um, and so that's work that we are intentionally uh, engaged in right now is that standardization of race, ethnicity, language um, data, and the education of our of our staff. One of the things I add. Onto that as well is is um, obviously collecting that person-centric data about who they are and how do they identify is really important. 
Um, but also one of the things that we are working on is, is what is the frequency at which you collect social determinants of health data and just understanding that um, situations change very quickly, especially in this environment. And so economic situations, social situations, mental situations for an individual can change. And so if we have SDOH data that is in the EMR or we're asking clinicians to do it in the clinic, that's great. But one of the things we're trying to do and we are doing is collecting that upstream and collecting it with more frequency um, because it can be very variable. And so screening earlier, leveraging technology to do that upfront so you can pass that information back to the clinics um, so that if you have that information in your EMR, it is ideally as updated as possible um, and, and empowering the clinicians to spend the limited time they do have on helping to support the individuals. Um, and so I think there's a lot of opportunity just in terms of data and data collection. Like some things are more stable and other things are more variable. And we need to get better at collecting that information upfront and doing it with more frequency, uh, especially in times of, of a lot of economic and social of people. Exactly, a really wonderful question. And thank you, Dr. Cole and Royal for your such such good insights there, um, really appreciate it. Um, if you haven't already, we do still have some time. Please submit a question um, for Dr. Cole or Royal, and we'll try to get to those if we have time. Um, there was a question that came in around navigators. Um, maybe Dr. Cole, this question is good for you, and then Royal can weigh in as well. But they're just wondering who are navigators and are they clinically trained? Yes, so um, the navigators are not clinically trained. Um, and so I, you know, I, I do want to make that really, really clear. And with that knowledge, um, you know, we, we, we knew that as we started to build the questionnaires around social determinants of health and behavioral health. And so one of the great things about uh, the docent platform is that we have uh, created escalation pathways. Um, because these are non-clinical um, staff members, um, we have very specific pathways to escalate issues, um, it, you know, as they come forward. And so those could be escalation pathways to community resources. They could be an escalation pathway back to the provider. Uh, it can be an escalated escalation pathway to behavioral health services. Um, one of the amazing programs that we offer at Common Spirit Health is a virtual maternity uh, behavioral health program. Uh, and so we have a pathway built based on what patients may um, tell the navigators um, to navigate them to, to that service. So, um, so they are not clinical, um, but they are an extension of the clinical team. And that's really kind of how we think about it. Um, one of the things, especially as it relates to screening for social determinants um, that I have found, and, and again, as a practicing physician who's done this, this work, is that sometimes patients may not want to divulge uh, that information uh, initially to their, their doctor or, or their care provider. Um, and if you really think about it, as physicians, as APPs, we may see a patient once a month, maybe, um, but usually they're like on an every three month cadence or even an every six month cadence, or, you know, sometimes some of us is a year, right? We go in for our annual exam and then we're like, I really didn't wanna come to see you for this, but I'm here uh, and I'm trying to avoid you the, the rest of the year, right? So um, the great thing about the docents is that they have very frequent, um, um, interactions um, with the patients. So they're building that level of trust um, pretty early on. Uh, and we're seeing that we're, we're often getting more information <laughs> from uh, about social determinants of health from th their engagement versus what the patient may divulge when they're in the, the physician office. So, um, so I think that's just, again, being very open to uh, having a really integrated care team um, that doesn't necessarily include only clinically trained individuals. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Cole. That was a really helpful explainer there. Um, we have another question, and maybe Dr. Cole, I think this one would be best directed toward you first, um, and then Royal, love to hear your thoughts as well. But an audience member is wondering where should health organizations start? 
you know, do we focus on addressing health equity within our organization? Do we adjust and create more SDOH related services or do we just jump straight into external partnerships? So how, how would you prioritize these? Oh goodness, that's a that's a great question, and you're probably not going to be necessarily happy with my answer. But <laughs> I, I'm going to say I think it, it's it's really dependent. Um, I think it's dependent on the healthcare organization itself. I think it's dependent on the communities or community that you're serving. Um, it's definitely dependent on the resources that um, you may have available. Um, so I think the first thing I would recommend is just kind of do an assessment to really see um, where your organization is in regards to addressing um, health equity if it's something that uh, you're, you get the sense that you know they're ready to do and they want to do, um, there are other like my individuals. I promise you, in your organization and even outside of your organization. Um, so find out who those individuals are and kind of start that that contingency, if you will, if you need to kind of do a more grassroots up um, uh, effort. Um, I would also really encourage that you do have clinical engagement um, as soon as possible. Um, you know, I think um, that is something that has been very helpful in um, both organizations that I have done this work um, in the past is clinical voice at the table to, you know, to ultimately say, this is better care for my patient and being able to connect it to the actual health outcomes is, is just really, really helpful. Um, and then the last thing I would say, use the data that's available to you. So if you're not yet at a place in your organization where you can pull that data specifically for the people that you're taking care of, the community level data is available to you in some way, shape, or form, um, especially around social determinants of health. There's a great heat map that you can look at on the CDC website um, that really jumps into you know, social vulnerability um, down to the uh, county level, down to the census tract level. Um, you know, there's the county health rankings that are out there. So there is a lot of data. It's not a lack of data in this day and age. Um, it's really around how do we analyze the data and what do we do with the data? So you know, I would say start there. Um, and, and see, you know, what your community may be dealing with. And, 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 um, and then the other thing is if you have, if you, one, if you're part of a, a not-for-profit healthcare system, you have to do a community health needs assessment every three years. They should be posted publicly on your website. So if you, you know, Google community health needs assessment, um, if you're not a not-for-profit, but there's a not-for-profit hospital in your market, well, guess what? They've done it. So <laughs> I think really leveraging these community health needs assessments um, that are required um, and, and looking at that information and, the, and that process itself engages the community uh, in there. So you really do get a good sense of that community voice and, and what they're, they're needing. So use, you know, one of my favorite quotes from author Ash is start, you know, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Um, so, you know, that's what I, I would encourage you. And if, and if you are ready, if your organization is really ready to, you know, be more intentional about it, um, I would say, please feel free to reach out to me and I can help you talk through some more ta tactical things. Yeah, just sitting on that, that outside and one of, I just, one of the things that's been really impressive about watching Common Spirit um, uh, over the last couple of years is, I, I think as Dr. Cole mentioned, it wasn't just one tactic, that, but the ability for the organization, like from a mission level was very clear, but then at the executive level, creating a health equities roadmap and really starting to break down what is our mission to our strategy, to our tactics, but not letting that stop them from doing work on the ground as well. And so a very intentional look at, okay, here's the programs that we have. How are we making sure that we're being more thoughtful about health equities in the programs that we already have and we already have that are deploying and engaging vulnerable populations? And so it's been to watch it sort of unfold at a, at a boots on the ground level and also from sort of the top of the organization down 
um, with a lot of just alignment on what's the intent. Um, and then I think a critical part that Dr. Cole leads is, and the investment in the organization to help guide that is sort of at a systemic level, at a system level, how are we learning, leveraging data, thinking about how we implement this across. So it, it, it really felt, at least watching from the outside, that there were sort of three pronged attack to this. And it wasn't where we've seen some organizations start with mission and intent, but sort of wait or struggling to figure out how to operationalize it. It was, we're going to start to operationalize it today. We're going to set the strategy and we're going to make sure that we are then taking those best practices and learning and continuing to iterate, um, which I think gets you started, but also gives you the potential to learn and get more data to continue to improve. Excellent. A really great question to end our conversation on today. I think it was an excellent overview of everything we spoke about and also it was forward looking. So Royal and Dr. Cole, thank you so much for your time today. And just want to thank our audience as well um, for joining us for an excellent presentation and Get Well Network, thank you for sponsoring today's webinar. If you'd like to learn more about the content presented today, please do check out the resources section on our webinar console and fill out the post webinar survey. Final thank you to all. I really hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks, Dr. Cole. Thanks, Royal.